resource here, I will add in Justin Johnson, who was the original, one of the original signatories to the Transportation and Climate Initiative uh, for Vermont in 2010, when it was launched to think about ways to reduce emissions from the transportation sector. Uh, which, you know, it, Put his name on paper. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta do something. Uh, so, we, uh, so in the intervening years, we've spent uh, time working with states that now extend the, or the TCI region, it's, extends from Maine all the way down to Virginia now. Virginia joined last uh, September. Uh, it also includes the District of Columbia, so uh, broad range of states, good uh, diversity of various forms of transportation included. Um, we Transportation is a much more complicated emissions picture than, say, our power production sector, where most of it comes from a few large power plants. And point sources are generally easier to control than uh, we are all the generators of carbon emissions from uh, in the transportation sector. Um, so in 2010, there was launched a process to evaluate what the information needs were, how what policies were out there, uh, with an eye towards a um, following on the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, which was the cap and trade system uh, for power production uh, within the Northeast region, Northeast and Mid-Atlantic states. So as many of the same states, there are a few more in the TCI region than there are in the in, in Reggie. Um, the, in December of this year, uh, every state in that region except for Maine and New Hampshire and kind of New York, uh, New York will come along eventually, uh, and Maine may join now that the administration has changed. Signed so on to a statement uh, to, to go through what we're calling a sort of two-gate process. To, the first gate was to sign on to be part of the conversation. The second gate will be whether or not people want to do this. And the this is to evaluate what a specific cap and trade for transportation would look like, Excuse me. how it would work, what the mechanisms would be, what the potential costs would be, and, and provide an opportunity for states to weigh in at that point as to whether or not it seemed appropriate for them. Can I ask you sure. why New York didn't sign that? Uh, I will give you the public version, yeah. uh, which is essentially that, that they, they have been, they're continuing to be part of the conversations. They just, they had other priorities at the present, at what was going on yeah. and, and just didn't get to the right people at the right time. So they're still part of the conversation. We expect them to maintain part of that conversation whether they decide to join or not is ultimately their choice, but it isn't. It wasn't a no. It was just like we're busy. It wasn't a. It wasn't a no. The, there's a longer answer that I'll happily explain to you over a beer sometime. Yeah. Um, it, but that that wasn't the case with delivery to die state. Uh, New Hampshire uh, was. They haven't been as active a participant, and so it wasn't a no. It just. There wasn't an affirmative yes. And I'm assuming with the change of governorship in Maine, that may be the attitude. They, there. we believe that they will come on uh, as well. So, interestingly, it includes Pennsylvania, which the Reg Reggie does not. Mm -hmm. Pennsylvania has uh, many truck long distance, long haul truck routes going to the Midwest, um, and so it was an interesting sort of addition to the to the mix. Uh, one of the big questions is whether or not ports are included in that. We don't necessarily have major port facilities, but New York, uh, Maryland, Delaware all have major port facilities that they're, you know, that there's a question about whether or not all those the are boats on the lake. Right, so when we're all living in sailboats or whatever the, you know, or barges, small tiny houses on, on pontoons, we'll need to evaluate that. Um, so the, what is happening now, essentially, is trying to figure out what the program would look like. And it's <coughs> a cap-and-trade system. I'll sort of talk generally about what a cap-and-trade system is first, kind of. Uh, there, it, the way it generally works is that unlike a command and control regulation where I tell each of you that you have to reduce your emissions by 50% over the next 20 years, I tell the room that they need to reduce their emissions by 50%, and you all figure out who can do it most cost-effectively. 
the, the, the chair decides he can't do anything cost effectively, he'll just buy allowances from the rest of the committee in order to meet the, the overall goal. So it allows the marketplace to establish to, to work at creating a more cost effective outcome. But it still arrives at the overall goal outcome. It works well for uh, issues where where there where where localized pollution isn't really the necessarily the concern. We're concern, concerned about global emissions generally, and so it works well for CO2. It, it worked uh, as, as a mechanism to deal with acid rain in the 80s and 90s. Uh, it has worked with, with Reggie to reduce from the power production sector. Uh, other other uh, jurisdictions around the, around the globe are using it to address uh, all sorts of emissions from different parts of the economy. Um, and as a reminder, I'm sure Michelle has told you in the past that 43% uh, of our emissions come from transportation. Uh, so it's a, it's a huge chunk of the problem and what the hardest to deal with because of our, all, all of our relationship with how we have to get around and how we have to travel and how we live our daily lives. So that's the basics of what a cap and trade system looks like. However, we have to do a lot of work to figure out what, what are the pieces in there that make it function. Fundamentally, there are a lot of things like what is the initial cap? What are our current emissions and how do we ratchet that down over time? And what does that slope look like? That is a negotiated process between 10 states, I think it's 10 states, and the District of Columbia to, to figure out what that looks like. That's a complicated process, as you can imagine, um, when we're trying to build consensus rather than having a, a, a vote. Um, but there are also other mechanisms of where do we set the ceiling price, right? So the prices don't get too high. Do we set some sort of, before you even get to the ceiling, do you put up what we call a cost containment reserve in place? Where additional allowances, so that cap would go up a little bit uh, to make sure that the costs uh, stay, stay lower. Uh, it's a supply and demand piece of that. There, there's also the, what does the floor look like and what is, is there a containment reserve on the on the low side to create an emissions containment reserve so we get the we stay on the emissions glide slope that we want to stay? Lots of complicated mechanisms. How do we do? How do we make sure that people aren't speculating and gaming the system? There's you know if we if there's we have through Reggie we have a group that does sort of our market security work for us. Looks at you know some similar things to what the SEC would look at just in terms of doing audits to make sure that people aren't trying to game the system and, and use it inappropriately. Uh, it, is a, it is a marketplace that is possible, so we want to make sure that nobody is trying to do that. Uh, there was a fair amount of speculation within the Reggie market as, as, the, um, as the federal government was considering the Clean Power Plan, which would have put um, carbon emissions reduction requirements on all states through their power production. and. So everybody sort of saw that as happening and thought that the value of Reggie would go, with the Reggie allowances would go up. And when the Clean Power Plan uh, has been pulled back in the current administration, the prices came back down and have been relatively flat. The Reggie program has worked in large part because we've set the sort of signal to the market and let them figure it out, but at the same time, there have been technolo technology advances that make it easier. You know, there's cheap natural gas present, advances in the way power, power is produced, uh, renewables have helped, but generally it's been mostly natural gas. And the other piece is most of the revenue that's been spent by the states has been on increasing efficiency. So we're getting reductions in our energy use um, so that the overall effect is we're using less power and um, and we're creating fewer emissions. So it's been a sort of, that, that piece uh, it kind of works in two ways. Um, we had kept our nuclear plant, we've been nice to get here. <laughs> no, I'm not gonna wait in the <laughs> What'd you say, Bobby? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, I voted to keep it open. <laughs> um, so we have, so that is, that's the sort of general uh, pieces that we're on. And so what I've asked, uh, and there's been lots of interest within the building about this, this process and what's, how it's going to work and what the outcomes are going to be. And most of the answer is, I don't know yet. We're going to figure that out as we go. There are, there are questions that we need to answer, but I don't know what those are. And they're going to build on the, 
each other, sort of to set up the governance structure and some of the decision making and sort of basic frameworks of the arrangement before we can get into the, some of the detail on what the cap's going to be and what, how then we do we do modeling to find out what we think the costs are going to be and how do we evaluate those pieces. Um, is, is that a staff at that being paid? Like TCI has their own staff and so, offices so that are working the, on it? So sort of. So the Georgetown Climate Center, uh, which is a arm of Georgetown University, has been our <coughs> nonprofit facilitators of this discussion for the past nine years. I didn't catch an affiliate of Georgetown, an affiliate of what? Uh, of Georgetown University. So it's, it's, a, it's a part of the, of the university. Okay. They have provided us the sort of staff resources and, and sort of facilitation pieces. They won't necessarily be the ones who are staffing the decision making. This will need to bring this back into the state fold to get into the details. So like you're doing some of that work. Cause like, I, like I know when Reggie was formed, we had PUC staff or board yeah. staff at the time going to those meetings yep. and kind of being the staff. So it's similar. So, so we have the same sort of team approach. It involves the agency of natural resources, the trans, uh, public service department. We're not clear what from the all P the states. Yeah, from all the states. We're not clear what the PUC's role is going to be because they don't regulate trans. You know, their unregulated fuels um, from the PUC's perspective. So it'll be interesting to see exactly how that will work. But since the beginning, the conversation has involved environmental, energy, and transportation officials from all states. And that there, that's who's doing the work, really. Right. These staff from all the state. Yep. State. And, and, and lots of us, thankfully, have experience with Reggie to bring to bear as we get into the decision making so we understand how these things work uh, because they are complicated and there's a lot of learned experience from the Reggie process because it hasn't always been perfect. Um, and are you working with the Washington Climate Initiative about like, kind of what worked and what didn't work? Or uh, we are, we, did, we've gathered a fair amount of information from Washington Climate Initiative over time. The, the challenge with WCI, which is the California and Quebec cap and trade market, is that they haven't actually done, the, the transportation sector hasn't actually really participated other than to buy allowances at this point. Because they're still in the low hanging fruit of the power production sector getting most of the emissions. Any reductions in emissions that we're seeing from transportation in California and Quebec are from the reinvestment of proceeds into electric vehicle incentives and public transit and the like, rather than from directly from, from the cap uh, playing effect. Because the price is just, it, it's cheaper to, to buy at this point. In your timeline for the TCI is Scares the hell out of me. Yeah, it's pretty fast. Uh, yeah, so the timeline is by next December, we're to make a decision. Each, each state has a decision point, right? That's that second gate, uh, is to decide whether or not we want to participate. That is an incredibly aggressive timeline. Uh, just from to put it into context, the last program review we did for Reggie, where we evaluate kind of where we are and what changes need to happen within the existing program, for two years, yeah. right? And it, there's more attention and there's more focus going to be put here than there than there was because we knew Reggie was working and we didn't necessarily need to make changes. Right. But it's complicated and there's a lot of back and forth. And different people, different states have different interests, and that's going to only become more complicated through this process where people's transportation profiles or their states' transportation profiles are so very different. Um, so things like what f generally what fuels are going to be covered. So if bunker fuels are covered in ports, do we do states even have jurisdiction there? Right. That's a question. Um, is it going to be simply gasoline and on-road diesel? Are there other pieces to it? Um, where is the point of regulation going to be? So it's easy with utilities because they're both the generator and you know generally they can. We, so we look to them for for point of regulation, but. You know, it's not the same. We're not going to require every person in the state of Vermont and around the region to enter the marketplace to decide how many allowances they need for their own emissions. It's going to need to be upstream from that. So what does that look like? Uh, Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> but the the to it, while this it also like a variation of actuarial analysis that we do in healthcare. Only it's not far off from that. In terms of the complexity. Yeah. But, it, but to, to go back to the why of this 
because it sounds uh, complicated. And so what, what's the value in it? What's, the why is essentially we get the whole region working together. So we get the allowances, or get the emissions reductions from the whole region. And unlike other, you know, bluntly unlike other carbon pricing pieces like a tax, we can set what emissions we want. So we get that tra downward trajectory and the marketplace finds the most efficient price rather than setting the price and hoping that we get the emissions reductions. So, event, so there will be costs that get borne by consumers as part of this. So the, the point of the evaluation is to understand what that impact is and how, what the, um, ultimately what, what it looks like and whether or not it makes sense for Vermont to be a part of it. But we can't answer those questions until we've done this work. So it's, it, it's certainly going to add to our, our What's knowledge. What's the time frame for this work? Yeah, so, so pretty much. Um, so we gave our, in December, we gave ourselves a year to basically get to the point where states were choosing whether to be in or out. And as part of this, we want to make sure that there's a, a robust opportunity for stakeholders to engage in the process um, and kind of weigh in. There are some that are, um, are used to that from the Reggie world, but there you know, will be different stakeholders in this process. We have, we've been doing a lot of stakeholder engagement over the years, but we need to, you know, we'll need to do more. Um, and so when you think about what that timeline looks like in terms of figuring out the details, doing the modeling work, engaging the public, and negotiating with a bunch of very disparate states, it's going to, uh, yeah. You're not going to do anything else? Uh, I don't <laughs> think uh, the governor, my secretary, will let me uh, focus entirely on this, but I will, you know, we'll have good people working on it. Try to find out this morning, Senator McNeil said roughly gasoline at 217 a gallon. We wonder why this is a big variance. No, 209. 209. Oh my God. Keep going down there, Ellen. Yeah. It, it, Thirsty Thursday. The county is 200. Drive the Ellen to gas up at 242. And truck. Just for gas. Look, I got it. That's I got it in his head. Right? <laughs> it's in his head. See, he's talking about it. I already got it there. Yeah. Yeah. Every Thursday, I said, today is Thursday oh, Thursdays. They dropped the price three to five cents a gallon. Yeah. So it's like 206 or something in some places. It's, it's 209. Area area. Like that, 242. 209 Sunday or Monday night. Whatever. So what you're talking about is what the governor's been, been referencing as a potential initiative that um, he's proposing for the state to take. Well, so I, he's. I'm just trying to link what yeah. your presentation is with what um, so this, has been in the paper, I right. guess. So this is very much, the governor isn't proposing that this should be something that we do. He, well, how so, could he until yeah, he signed, really the yeah, he signed on to say, let's, let's do the analysis, let's sit at the table, yeah. and, then, and then we can all decide together. Yeah. And just, just for reference, the way, so your engagement in the Reggie process was to, at the beginning when we agreed to, to, to the program, was to authorize the, the various state agencies to do the work and gave rough parameters and then gave us rulemaking authority to, uh, to, it, to put it into place. At the same time, you also decided where the proceeds would go. Um, and we would imagine the same process would work, would be the way if this were to move forward. So if you know, that we could be having a, a more specific conversation next year if that's the decision. Yeah. Um, Just also to put it into to, to make clear on what it is and what it isn't, this isn't a compact of states. We don't have federal authority to have a specific compact. It's a it it, it would be as Reggie is a group a, a, an agreement between the states to have identical or nearly identical programs that are linked together and share the auction platform for the allowances. So it it's somewhat complicated, but it gets us by the whole needing to have federal authority for a compact. So when we negotiate what the, what the model regulation should look like for all states, it's kind of, I, I just want everybody to be aware that it's not something that we can then tinker with a whole lot in Vermont, because otherwise the thing will fall apart. So. Getting 10 states to agree, uh, it's a Herculean. It really kind of gives me the heebie jeebies <laughs> but uh, yeah. It, we we play a good role in Vermont because we are we are not the largest player 
in the room and we can be bridge builders. We have Ben and Reggie because we, we can help people come together and we're generally nicer than most people. So, uh, and still get what we, what we need out of the program. Um, Reggie has been financially a, uh, a generally positive for the state of Vermont because we've gotten more, way more allowances than we've paid in terms of cost. And to be able to reinvest those, those have primarily gone into uh, weatherization work um, because we, you elected to, to put that money towards weatherization rather, to, towards thermal efficiency work rather than electric efficiency work because of the work that was already happening in the electric efficiency side. Any other questions, comments? So right now you don't see a, a role for the legislature until we get to December, and so it would be next legislative session if the decision is to move forward, then that's when we need authority for rulemaking and those kind of things. That would be my ask. I do understand there's interest in, in weighing in in some form or fashion. I, my concern... You mean from the legislature? Yes. Weighing in this year? Not as I have le heard it less on the Senate side than on the House side. So what I what I what I have said in, in most committees is is that there that this is as you can imagine with ten states it's very complicated and there are different ways for us to get to the same end result from an emissions perspective and a cost perspective by changing different levers within the system and if you tell us that we have to do it x what this way and that way I won't be able to get there. Um, so that that that's my ask. I, I don't I don't you know, the, the support for the process yeah, is fine. Don't get into the details. <laughs> yeah. And and I know every, everybody wants to know the details and I'm happy to share them as we go, but we're just not into that phase yet. And what do you think of the idea of Vermont signing up as a, a, not as full members, but as uh, participating and just as, as observers in WCI in case the TCI doesn't work out or something like that? Um, or is that muddy the waters too much? I think we have a process that's, that's working that we're actively engaged in. I do think the WCI question is more complicated because we have an existing cap and trade through Reggie for part of the, right. we would, are talking about this other piece for TCI. WCI has lots of pieces that, it, so it covers the entire economy for the, the cap and trade. So, TCI, I sorry, it's the Transportation Climate Initiative. Oh, okay. It is the, the, T, the, for, the oh. yes. T for transportation. T for, there you go. They're trying to play it to your, soon, your, your tune. <laughs> um, WCI, yeah, Western that Climate I know. Initiative. I know what WCI Okay, is. so WCI covers the entire economy, uh, all emissions from the economy. I just thought maybe it could be trans. <laughs> that, that, we don't have any European members no. or African members no. yet. That would be fun. Well, we think they do. <laughs> uh, I have some concerns about trying to link up part of our system with WCI because Reggie is working, so I wouldn't want to monkey with that. Yeah. The price difference between WCI and Reggie right now is pretty significant. It's three to four times higher in WCI, mm -hmm. and it is actually built in that it will increase over time no matter what um, and, and we do have some of that in Reggie but it's more aligned with inflation mm -hmm. whereas WCI increases the floor increases 5% plus inflation every year with the idea that they're trying to get people to make investments early so that they see a return on that investment going forward. There's some sense to it but at the same time eventually you get to a cost that, that the public is not willing to bear. Uh, because you've created an inefficiency in the marketplace. So, uh, and so given the limited resources that we have, I prefer to focus on this, because this is gonna be a lot of work. And I think the other piece for the transportation side, given how much leakage there could be in the system, right, for other people going, driving their cars to say, if, you know, once Rutland secedes, it becomes its own separate state. <laughs> Just kill it. People are, you know, are, are, are mobile for transportation, 
And so, especially with New Hampshire not being in the mix, that's a complication. Uh, but if we were to join WCI, none of our region, region would be in there. So our prices would be, would go up and nobody else's would. And so it doesn't create that shared environment that, where the, the costs are comparable. We're hoping you make GCI work. Okay. We're not, we're kind of, you're, 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 you understand all this stuff. <laughs> yeah, you're the lead. <laughs> that's his daily work every day. Yeah. Well, we've, all right. Well, if I'm, I'm happy to come back later in the session, I may have some more specifics on where we are, and I'm happy to update you if that's helpful. Sure. Um, but at this point, please let me give me the flexibility to figure out if this can work. Thank you very much for coming over. Thank you very much. So, um, Peter, uh, we have committee discussion at ten. I'm supposed to meet the governor at ten. No, we can do what we're doing now. Um, I, I, I won't bother you, but I, I need to follow up on Milfoil, and probably I should just talk to Rebecca. Would that be the easiest thing? Uh, probably. I, I can let her know that to come find you. If you would. I would. Okay. Or I can talk to you. Uh, the other one. What's your other <coughs> The agency that you want to talk to. ANR. I need to talk to yeah. ANR. Oh, okay. Water quality. Milfoil has a transportation fuel. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> no. Both Decker. 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 I don't know, a thousand tires on our property. And um, the property owner is supposed to be responsible for the disposal, but. Well, yeah. Wheels for warmth. I don't think they're that, that, that quality. Way. Way. <laughs> and so, uh, um, needless to say, when somebody has illegally dumped yep. that level of uh, that volume. Meant, one person dumped that many years ago. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's a requires, wow. She didn't know? I think, that, I think they do know. I think they do know oh. who did it. But anyway, I, I can imagine as a property owner, it would be a little disconcerting to find, <laughs> you know, hundreds and right. hundreds of tires. I'd like to have enough property where I don't notice it's Right. Yeah. Oh, I know. <laughs> that's, 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 that's it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> said it. Yeah, well. If you do and have just a few acres and it's back or on a dirt road, yeah. you know, it's conceivable. Do this because you made for us. First in 10 years. Do this. Well, now you know who you are. We're going to a joint hearing this morning, so we're going to bring them oh. up. What time is that? Any questions you have for each other? 10. Oh, 10. Um, I run the risk of repeating things, so I don't think I should. Well, you're I'll ask a question if you, it's already been asked. Uh, don't I'm answer. happy to answer it. No, I don't want you to answer it twice. Is there anything we, is there a role, in your opinion, of the legislature in these coming months when you do the work that most of which has to happen in essentially a From the Senate, Senate, yes. From the House, no. Is that the answer? This is a question that I'm hearing I, so far. <laughs> thank you for your testimony. This, okay, is, a, this is a question that I am very happy to answer as many times as this. He just mentioned that a couple of times. It is. At this point, I, we don't need any support from the legislature. They don't need to be encumbered with instructions <laughs> from the legislature. As, as you know, the, the worry right. the worry collectively from the administration and the legislature would be that you feel like the administration gets to a place where you feel like you've done the best following the administration's guidance, and the legislature says, but we don't like it. That would be the worst moment to reach after all the hard work for the next year. And so that's the how we that's fair. how we find a way to avoid getting to a point where you think you've done a good job and legislature says not good enough, and then you find yourselves on it. you and the governor possibly entering the state into something, and then you got a legislature trying to figure out what you know that that I don't know how we. So my role is very clear. It's to get the best possible deal for the state of Vermont, given what's possible negotiating with 10 other states. Mm -hmm. If you choose not to like it, 
that's your authority not to like it. I can't. I'm not going to be able to go back and it's not going to, if we're going to have a Brexit situation where I'm going to go back and be like, well, we really want a better deal. In my no, I, that's it. I understand. It. And I think part of it is that the extent to which things can be communicated. And I know that's hard, so I don't yep. profess to know what to do, but I think the in the loop quality is probably as important as some of the. Yep. So, so one of the things that, that is my, one of my guiding principles and have, I've been pushing folks within the discussion about is that by mid to late summer we need to have a series of sort of what we've decided upon in terms of you know the structure of the organization and then some opportunities for the public to comment on what the cap looks like and how it goes down and then the modeling results associated with that to show what the economic impacts would be. And that gives the opportunity for people to weigh in. And what I would offer at that point is for, and that's a that's a gut check for all the states to sort of see what their what their citizens are saying. Mm -hmm. And that would be a great opportunity in advance of that, before that goes out, to sit down with you. I know it's over the summer, but I think it's that's that's what the trajectory we're on. And to sit down and, and provide a briefing to say, here's where we are, and here's um, you know, here's the pieces that I think are going to be sticking points, and here's what the projections look like, and we, you know, need to negotiate within that frame. Yeah. If that's helpful, I'm happy to do that. Well, that's, I think it definitely yeah. would be, and I think it would be, you know, we'll figure out the right forum, right format for that to occur. And one of our broader challenges, you know, the energy goals and carbon reduction goals we have as a state, <clears throat> partially are dependent on the success of this strategy and help inform what other things we do to complement it and um, you know looking even at the RFF report which I'm sure you saw which had you know had estimates of, of the both the financial and environmental impacts of a TCI yep. um, though they admit it it depends on what's actually negotiated right. so our attempt to reach those goals is influenced by so uh, I'm glad you brought up the RFF report I think I would just add a couple of things as you as you think about TCI relative to that report um, a couple of things that they did as part of that discussion uh, were to, because they didn't know what TCI was going to look like, right? That's fair. Uh, was to use the, the WCI price, the current pro or projected price, as a, as a placeholder for TCI. I can tell you that there's no way that any of the states are going to agree to a price that high because it's three or four times higher than what they're paying in Reggie right now. Mm -hmm. And that is the that is the sort of the starting point for most states. They they acknowledge that, I believe. They yeah, they acknowledge that certainly. And the other piece that they 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 relied on the price to drive action, so they converted the the WCI price to be the TCI price, and then they saw what that price would do to to emissions rather than reflecting on the fact that it's the cap that does the emissions reductions I or see. within the cap traces. So there's a little bit kind of... It's more back the envelope than... Uh, yeah, I think there's more... I think this the, the information we get over the course of this coming year will provide much more specifics as to what the impact of this specific program would be. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. So if you just tell the back home, I will. stop by. Uh, Mill foil, uh, foil, foil into and biofuels. Yeah. Mill foil and tires. Yeah, it makes the two. Milk. <laughs> I don't think we want to use the. Can we not use tires in the fuel? Can we just use <laughs> the mill foil? Governor said. We also want burns. What? Burns all fuel. Oh, yeah. We did up many college parties on that. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, high school parties. Watch it. My college parties were crazy. Of course. It was garbage. Thanks, for Thank you very much. Yes. Well, the not I thought it was I thought it was a different person.
I'll have a meeting with her. Is that different? Our next meeting this morning is at 10 30. We're going to talk about a joint hearing in <coughs> room 11. That's probably 10. I don't know which room we're going to do. Uh, the transportation in the House and Senate. Uh, it's Governor Day, local Governor Day. So we'll have there. Well, Chair Mazza, I have a, a draft bill that we that I talked about before. I, okay. I yeah. can send you copies of it. And he has drafted it. Okay. Uh, it's still draft. We'll one those yeah. afternoon. But if you want to talk about it, we'll read it. Yeah, we got, we got 20 minutes. Go ahead. Okay. 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 Draft 6.2. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah, she and I have been okay. working on okay. The main question is does the committee want to do this as a committee bill or should I go and just submit it as a bill and then see where it goes and then just decide at that point? Because if it, since it deals a lot with terraces, Senator Ash had mentioned it might just go to finance. So that, that's one question that I wonder. Do you go to natural resources too? Uh, it could. Maybe they want to take it like they did our other bill. They might. I don't. What? What? Is there anything in here that would be a natural resources committee jurisdiction? I don't think so. Okay. But I would need to go back and look at here. Seems like it's just lines. It seems like it's rates and which would only be finance. And then the two jurisdictional issues, which are finance. There's stuff about the transportation fund. Yeah, right. those go to the transportation fund for which is purposes. appropriations, but not natural. Obviously, the goal is not to avoid natural. I'm just wondering in terms of steps along the way. It's really setting up a regulatory scheme for how rate setting is going to happen, and then what is factored into the rate setting in terms of the additional fees to recoup money for transportation infrastructure, um, much like the gas tax already does, and then incentivizing certain things. <coughs> like the vehicle charging stations. That certainly gets into an area we've talked about for a long time, and that is with the growth of EVs, how we um, generate the revenues um, to support our transportation infrastructure. Right. Um, like, so from that perspective. That's central part of the reason, purpose of the bill. And we did have that section in the T bill last year around the um, PEC, the study, all of that. So, um, and this is very much linked to what the PEC might or might not recommend at the end of their investigation. And what it is doing is instead of having the EEC, the energy efficiency charge, it sort of is pulling that out of what the rate for electricity is and having that go to more transportation based purposes. I'd see finance all, all over this as it would relate to, because you're Yeah, there's, no, there's no natural resource lot, you know, uh, jurisdiction here. We don't want to be stranded there for The question, though, if really, I think we, from my point of view, I just want to better understand what's in it. Yeah. You know, you're given a walkthrough before deciding, because to be a committee bill means three people on <coughs> the committee have to sort of enthusiastically like it. And mm -hmm. Yeah, um, no, I didn't mean that as a lot question of before. Of I okay, why don't you go through it? But, but if, if, after walking through and thinking a little on it in the next couple of days, I think if the majority of the committee kind of likes it, I actually think it is more appropriate to come here and then go to finance. Mm -hmm. And that is not unusual with things like the DMV fee bill in the past, yeah. which has originated here. Yeah. It goes to finance the transportation bill when it has different taxes or fees has been started here, gone there, and this would be no different. Um, we would just need to give them enough time to... Okay, help us understand what's through here. In some parts of it can be lighter touch, so that we don't get finance to go more. Um, do you want me to go through it? Do you want Anthea to go through it? I think that's your call. If you want me to, I'm happy to, but straight up. Why don't you both think of whatever you want? Why don't you start off with the other? Okay. Um, so what we're doing in section one is we're adding two new definitions to title 23. One is an electric vehicle. 
which then incorporates plug-in hybrid electric vehicles for simplicity purposes. And it's also defining electric vehicle charging stations. We just don't have those definitions in statute yet, and we're using them a lot throughout. Can we ask questions here? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I know that in some of the presentations we've received, um, the term EV has included plug-ins. I'm just making sure, it, is that, do we think that makes it kind of consistent with the use of that term? Um, I think when you're talking about infrastructure, it definitely makes sense to have them go together because since they're both getting plugged in, since they're both getting yeah. plugged in, okay. and we're using it to sort of build mm -hmm. into the definition of electric vehicle charging station. And ten through twelve makes it explicit. It needs a plug-in hybrid. Yeah. Right. I'm just I'm just making sure it's not creating a different sort of industry term. Oh. Uh, I will say in other bills that I've worked on that have had definitions included, it's been split out and there's been a separate definition for plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. Some of the feedback that Senator Kirchhoff and I got on this bill was that it just was sort of making it very cumbersome when you then said an electric vehicle charging station was used to charge this and that. It was very duplicative when the words were used. Um, section two is taking the language that you were provided from the Public Utility Commission, which was basically to say, we, the Public Utility Commission, do not have jurisdiction over electric vehicle charging stations that are not being operated by distribution utilities, the ones that like ChargePoint could theoretically set up. We don't have jurisdiction over them so that they can charge by the kilowatt hour because we're not able to have the non-distribution utilities charge for electricity. They were, it sounds like. But that's sort of the, the loophole was to say you're charging for the time that you're plugged in as opposed to electricity. So instead of just saying that the Public Utility Commission does not have jurisdiction over electric vehicle charging stations separate and apart from the ones that the DUs would have, it's setting out sort of tiers of jurisdiction that's lighter than what you would have for a distribution utility, but still having some oversight so that there are consumer protections there and establishing a rulemaking process. I don't know if you want to talk about your motivation behind that. I think that yeah, plays so into the, the, the CUC said we don't want any jurisdiction, and my thinking is that we want to have some jurisdiction. It could be very small, It'd just be like on the terms and conditions, so that charging station just could do whatever they wanted. They couldn't charge, you know. Five hundred dollar fee every time you hook up or something. So you want to have just consumer basic consumer protection. So if there's bad actors, there's a way to to deal with that. And also, so we can just collect data, so we know where they are. So it could just be as simple as a registration system that ChargePoint could send in a quarterly report to the PUC. Here's the ten stations we installed, and we're fall we certify we're going to follow the terms and conditions on on how to do charging stations in the state. So. <coughs> What would what would it look like to write, to to provide that consumer protection to term through terms and conditions? What would be You're so if they, if they want to charge five hundred dollars to plug in, for instance, right? They probably not do very well. Right. Maybe maybe they get people once, but not twice. Yeah. Uh, what 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 is the set of things that the commission would look at and then maybe come in and punish someone? Or is that, is so they, that there would be, they set up a rule, is what the bill asks them with. Okay. I'm sorry, maybe, maybe I'm premature. No, so but it's, it's the question, the answer, it's a good question. And the, the, I didn't see the terms really like you can't charge over this dollar amount, but if somebody were to complain, if, if there was a consumer complaint, or if they were doing something damaging vehicles or something like that, or like if I, I see something in the rule would be like, if you have a charging station, you're required to say what the cost is going to be per kilowatt hour, so that when you pull up there and you decide to charge, you can see, oh, it's going to like be like a gas pump has a yeah, it's going to be like a dollar ATM. Yeah. Or, yeah, or the ATM says, do you want to pay three fifty, or you know, you get a chance to just to back out before you hit it. So that kind of stuff would be in here, but it wouldn't be anything about the rates and things like that. And some of that is laid out on the bottom of page four at lines um, eighteen through the end. Everyone charge the same. Every station charge the same. No. no. So it's going to be complicated. just like gas. Okay. Right. So it's going to be like gas. Okay. Right. So you would know. So if yeah, if you went there once and they charged 
two dollars a kilowatt hour, you're like, well, I'm not going to go back there. Um, Only in emergency would I charge theirs. But if there are five different companies that each are in GMP territory, and mm -hmm. they're each going to then turn around and be a service, mm -hmm. they're all buying from GMP at the same rate. Yeah. Then the question is how much they think they can get away with right. marking it up to yeah. cover their costs and get profit, right? Yes. That would be okay. Well, and we that's we're not we regulated. We get the same amount for transportation fund. That would be the same, yeah. So they all pay GMP the same. They all pay the same kilowatt hour fee that goes to transportation. But then, if whatever their margin or profit would be, that would be up to them. We're just as like with gas stations, we don't regulate. Got it. Well, <coughs> you know, last year when we were talking about, you know, clarifying um, PUC authority, regulatory authority, it did, and obviously, um, whatever it is, um, charge point. Charge point yeah, they wanted to know. They, they wanted to be treated as a service, and, uh, and so it's good that we've got, clear, clear, we've got a pretty um, clear statement from the PUC saying they don't want to, they don't view that they want to regulate this. And, um, We're and saying I, we want a little bit of regulation, and it's the example I was given to is the PUC doesn't regulate Comcast. So you, the Comcast can charge you whatever they want, but there is terms and conditions that the PUC does control right. over cable. So that's similar. So that's the similar, it's yeah. just like there's some regulation but not over rates. So I personally, agree, I'm glad they made that recommendation that it should be subject to their regulatory authority. No, they, yeah. they, they did, their recommendation was not to have any, any PUC oversight. Well, I know they went, to, but I'm glad they at least <laughs> we were going to pull it back and yeah. say there are certain things that we in fact want to have in place. but. I would, I think the message that we got was that if they, if we treated these service entities as the equivalent of a utility and brought them yeah. into regulation, right. that would have a very detrimental impact on the development of our charging um, station network. Right. And so I'm, I'm just saying I'm glad the PUC came in with what they yeah. did, even, even though we're going to maybe put some, um, some conditions under it. This also leaves the um, space for the Agency of Natural Resources, or sorry, Agency of Agriculture or Markets. Oh, because hey, of weights and measures. Weights and measures. Yes, they can weigh in on that. And they don't really have standards yet for that, but there is language in here about how they should work with the PUC to establish that process. And it remains to be seen if there's a way, much like they fill something volumetrically to figure out if it's dispensing the right amount of volume, how do you figure out if something's dispensing the right amount of electricity? And why the um, Public Utility Commission for this limited you know, consumer protection work versus agriculture? You know, we talked about how they do the gas station oh, pumps right. and making yeah. sure well, what's the... Well, they're, they, they, I can see culture these. would be involved in the rule making, so they could have that as part of it. But since the PUC is dealing with the utilities, and the rule could be that the utilities gather this information and set it in the rules since they're already having this customer relationship with the charging stations, the PUC could do it through the utilities since they're going to be selling them. But, you, but PUC you're, versus AG is but, your question. But, but are you saying that the PUC rulemaking may suggest that the agency of AG be the one that do the on-site inspections, for yes. instance, of making sure the thing is giving you the right yes. readout for the amount of time you yes. in? Okay, so it doesn't necessarily mean we're going to have a second set of right. people going to a gas station that has both gas Definitely. and charging. Okay. Is there, does the department weigh in at all, or would they yeah. just weigh in as, well, maybe it's in here, but um, in terms of recommending what those protections might be or requirements? Yeah, it has the PUC working with the Public Service Department and Agriculture yeah. on the rules, and the Agency yeah. of Transportation. Page 4, lines 11 and 12. Oh, okay. okay. So the next section, section three on page five, this is laying out tariff setting and this is establishing two different ways that electricity is priced basically. You've got the normal residential consumer and then separate electricity rates for electricity that's being used for electric vehicle charging stations, whether it's going to these charge point stations, as you said, everyone's getting it from GMP, or if it's GMP having their own stations. And this is laying out the rate setting mechanism, and you'll see a lot of language about what is to be considered in rate setting in the next section. 
but this is establishing the two fees that are being pulled off to go to the transportation fund. The first one is in um, subdivision B on page six. There's a uh, one penny per kilowatt transportation infrastructure assessment, and that will go, it'll be on the bill, we're mirroring language about the EEC, you need to be given the ability to find out what it's being used for. But it's gonna go to a separate account within the transportation fund to be used for the rehabilitation, reconstruction, or replacement of state bridges. So very much like the infrastructure bonding language. And then the other fee is the, oh, I'm sorry, that one's an egg. The other fee is the transportation efficiency fee. And that's the one that goes to a separate account within the transportation fund. Same language about how it needs to show up on your bill. And that will be used by the agency of transportation to provide um, electric vehicle um, transportation efficiency, public transit and passenger transit by rail, electric vehicle charging infrastructure, and last mile transit options. And there's a reporting back on that saying what they've been using that for. Who determines the fund, whether the fee whether it goes up or down? This is set in statute, um, which is different from the EEC, which is done through rulemaking on an annual basis. And there's a separate fee for um, BED and then all of the other distribu distribution utilities. Gas taxes. Yeah, it'd be like a, it this would just be, like be a variation of a fee bill. I mean, yeah. in terms of the, okay. the watches. But so this well, the one percent efficiency one, so it's not the one that goes to the transportation fund, but the efficiency one, the first in A, mm -hmm. is one cent meant to roughly mirror what people pay as a percentage of their on their electric bill for efficiency. I know that was the concept, yeah, was but, but is one cent have any relationship to the... It's slightly less. The EEC charge on their presidential bill is like one point like some oh, percent. So, you know, it's, it's, so it was a, just, just to make it easy, round it off, and just to one. So, so <coughs> in that one, the Public Utility Commission makes a decision, and then the charge goes up or down. We don't check in each year. This one, though, if we wanted to change it, it would have to go through the legislature. Did you contemplate having it tied to the efficiency charge? We did. In a <clears throat> way that the legislature doesn't have to come back and look like we're always. Yeah, I think I mean, before we got to six point two, we had it tied to the as a percentage of the like 90%. eighty percent, yeah, ninety percent of the EEC charge. But then there's really that set with this whole other parameter, so it didn't make sense to tie it to that. I think maybe in a, eventually, maybe after you change it a few times, we would want to set something automatically so you don't have to come back every time. Mm -hmm. But maybe we thought at first that the legislature would just want to set it and then keep that control of how it changes instead of trying to design, design a system of how they decide when to move it up and down. And, then, and the other one, the, the one that replaces basically the gas tax, mm -hmm. how does that work? is that one cent have any relationship to the current gas charge. I think it's probably a little bit less, less than it would be. I think you had testimony yesterday that it was like a penny and a half. There's, so in the report, Senator Kitchell showed me the report that you guys received in 2012 that estimated at around a penny and a half. Uh, There's some discussion I had discussed with Michelle yesterday that the email there might be higher if you add in the PIB and the per gallon tax. But I wasn't really clear how how it was being calculated, like what the equation was. So we could look at it, but it could be as high as five cents a kilowatt hour. The last thing I want to do is have that come up as an increase, decrease over every year. year. Yeah, every year because let me tell you, we yeah. go we go public with a two cent gas tax increase, we get killed one cent. I'd like to have something. I don't know about Michelle, how you feel that sort of. Yeah. Blends in so it floats, yeah. floats, or I don't know what the, yeah. I don't know what the system is, but you know, right now we we need a gas tax, but who's going to come up for a gas tax? Just, you know, right. So this could it could be like a percent. Well, uh, you could do a percentage like you do with the tip, but the idea was to set it here and then kind of get things going and, and see how it goes, and then come back and let me back. Make it clear. I want to make sure the agency because I don't want to fool around with this thing going forward. Because this is, going to be, this is going to be a growing thing, as we all know. We want to set the stage without having to come back every year or six months and <coughs> screwed up or something. So, so one thing I, I'm willing to do is work with the Agency of Transportation on what the what that equation is and be able to explain it to folks. And 
And what I would maybe say is that, that we ramp it up over time. If it really is four or five cents a kilowatt hour, that we start with one and then give, give it a yeah, chance to but, but, but then you're going to have to raise it. Yeah, but it's just raised in statute, like every year it'll raise a cent or something like that. Do it once with a schedule of increases oh, rather yeah. than have to keep, yeah, keep doing each right year. Just step along This way. is very, very critical yeah. because I want to make sure I understand that it's going because this is this is this is the start of something like the gas tax was hundred years ago or whatever. And I want to make sure that we're doing it right. the right way. Because the last thing I want to do or the next person is going to do is stand up and say, "Well, we got to raise it three cents because we underestimated." Right. And, uh, um, I. Jim had a question. Oh, sorry. Here. Um, in relation to the one cent uh, kilowatt hours, what is that uh, equals to a gallon, half a gallon, or of gas? Well, it, so I mean, that's the whole kind of question about like it's they kind of convert it to miles and dollars per mile driven, and, and then try to make that conversion around because different vehicles have different efficiencies, and just like with internal combustion engines, it's it's different. So that's. That's where we need a, a clear explanation of how we're making the change. Okay, methodology that got you done. Because when I go back home, I'm going to have to explain this exactly yeah. what this is right. without. Right now, that, I think we all right. spit corn right, right. now. Right now, it, I'm, I can't really explain it in a way that it's clear to where how, how we get from whatever the kilowatt hour cost is, whether it's one cent or five cents, to the two cents a gallon and two percent tip. Like that's that's the part that I. Can't really explain really easy right now. One of so there's a placeholder for that. recommendations <coughs> that, and it was a joint recommendation from the Department um, of Public Service, the Agency of Transportation, and the Agency of Natural Resources. And what they filed with the PUC was that it should be a per kilowatt fee to sort of make up what's being lost in lost ga gas revenue, and it should phase in at a certain point so you wouldn't hinder emerging technology. And I believe they had that at when the um, market share was 15% in a year was their trigger point. So doing a phase in would align with that recommendation. And, and one thing, if it's too high, then you have an incentive to not plug into your charger at your house. So if your, your car charger is hooked to this tariff, if that is higher than your rate of your lights and everything else, then there's an incentive to kind of work around your charger, you know, and not not go through this tariff. So we, we want this tariff to be at or below the residential rate so that you're, you purposely want to use this rate to charge your vehicles. Mm -hmm. I had a question about the revenues. It seems like unlike the gas um, revenues, tax revenues that, that support a variety of parts of our transportation infrastructure, including road maintenance, and uh, this seems to limit it more to um, physical structures. It is limited. And, really? Oh. And so I'm just thinking as this technology grows, we may be constraining the use so that we um, are cannibalizing other parts of our, um, our of our transportation needs. So I'm a little concerned about... Can you give an example of yeah. something that the normal gas tax supports that the... That well, the biggest one... Really, I'm right. just wondering what this... this I'm looking, it says to be used for rehab, rehab reconstruction, replacement of state bridges, Well, culverts, the most obvious one is the maintenance. Well, and the, and the I, I consider maintenance. Rehabilitation of roads. Yeah. So I guess the question is, is no, this I, different I, than the... Michelle, what, what, what's your... Thing? So um, the, the T fund or state funds match federal funds, which is principally the infrastructure that's talked about here, pays for our staff including all of our administrative staff to run programs, um, our maintenance staff to plow roads, um, et cetera. And so um, I would say a, a lion's share of our state funds is not actually building a bridge, you know, um, reconstructing a culvert, et cetera. It's kind of all the support services and the match to make those things happen. So it would be very detrimental to set up the language to restrict the broad array of things the T fund currently, um, including yes. grants, miles, yeah. just to give towns money. Yeah, for the, the town, <coughs> the town resources. I think the uh, efficiency fund concept to go straight to funding. Um, Rail, public transit, whatever, spot, bike and yeah, pet that, that was fine. That's fine, but I think um, we would um, not 
serve the current service the T fund administers if we were to move to this other well, one. Well, why can't it just be dedicated to the same thing the gas tax is? The language fix would be to instead of having to go to a transportation infrastructure account, it would just go to the transportation fund. That's right. really what I'm asking. Right. Which I'm okay with. I would. I asked Anthea to take the language from the, the TIB fee because uh -huh. I was trying to match that, but I'm, I'd be okay with it going. Well, uh, our concern is we are seeing the growth of EVs. Um, it, then you're going to see a concurrent reduction in the money into the transportation fund that has a great deal of, of latitude about how, how it's spent. And so uh, as we look to the future um, and that revenue replacement, um, from this revenue source, I, I just that's why I raise it. I, I just I, I just see that could be problematic. Maybe not originally, but sounds like you're open to going to. Yeah, no, I just called it the transportation infrastructure assessment, so I wanted to keep it the infrastructure. But we maybe keep the name. They want wages more on the staff. Right, right. My job is one. Blooming air. Who else did I mean? There'll be bridges, just no people. Yeah. Oh, you're off to a good starting. Yeah. Oh, wow. well, 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 It's good to start with a little bar, though, and you can yeah. rehabilitate. <laughs> Redeem yourself. People like a redemption story in politics. <laughs> so the next section is setting out how the tariffs are determined. And you'll see language later on in the bill where the distribution utility is above a certain um, customer base, and this is in section five, the next section, are required to um, file tariffs with the Public Utility Commission on or before December 1st, 2019, and then the PUC would review them based on all of the considerations that are Next laid out in the tariff language starting at the bottom of page seven. And I can't take that for granted. This language, this, this came from draft. So this is what they think the tariff should be. Yeah, so, I, so I met with the regulatory assistance project staff for you know, two people that used to work with PC, and they, they had suggested this, this kind of tariff language. You had mentioned on the top of page eight that you thought that we should start with just the larger utilities, and that's why you're going to have some threshold 17,000 customers and above. Would that be GED, Vermont Electric, BED? Yeah, BED yeah, is Anyone the smallest else? of the three at just about so just 19, three Yeah. And then the idea would be take it from there. Yeah. Maybe include others, but not. Right. And then it's all, they could file a tariff. And it's per oh, tariff. Yeah. Okay. So WEC, Washington Electric Co-op wanted to do it, they could do But the three big dogs would be compelled. Yeah. Okay. And that's going to cover 80% of customers or more than And what Senator Perslick was talking about earlier, where you don't want to have the electric vehicle charging be so expensive that people are just plugging it into their homes by having the rates be set with different considerations, you're setting up sort of um, two paths. You know, you're at home, you can charge in different ways. The electrical vehicle charging stations out in the world are having these different rates. Well, why don't we buzz through the last couple of pages and uh, we have another meeting. Uh, so we can just get through it. So, Section 5, requiring the tariffs to be filed on December 1st of 2019. Yeah, page 11. Yeah. Page 11, yeah. Um, section 6 is requiring the Public Utility Commission to make rules um, on or before December 1st, 2020. Um, and that's laying out a lot of what that sort of consumer protection, weights and measures, regulatory um, scheme would be. And then a lot of this is just sort of um, tidy up language in um, Section 7. Um, some of this is coming from what the Agency of Transportation has proposed um, in the T-bill for purposes of their ability to set fees if they're going to have electric vehicle charging stations. Um, I think they're planning on having that be something that there's more state-owned infrastructure for. Nine will have to be changed. Yeah. Nine. Uh, on page to the, 13, reference to, to the, the infrastructure. Uh, yeah. Oh, uh, subdivision nine, not yeah. section nine. Okay. Um, Sorry, yeah. Yeah, so and then instead of that one going to the transportation infrastructure account, it would go just to the transportation fund. And then section eight, as Senator Control noted already, is just laying out what goes into the T fund. 
because we're creating new two new revenue sources for it. Okay, well, that gives us a rough idea of what we're dealing with. And, uh, so, Andy, this approach would uh, be an alternative to what we had um, a study out of the UVM group to um, do it on the registration. Mm -hmm. This would um, be, yeah. in some ways, this is more forward looking in terms yeah, and of. And the technology has changed, the metering yeah. technology has changed since that report, I think, because they were really concerned about how you would meter a kilowatt hour charge in that report. And, and we think that has, there's not as much of an issue there. There was. Was, it, how would, um, was there any thinking that there'd be somebody who um, generated their own power and directly charged? Meaning, if you, what's that? I don't know, I'm trying to think like a, a vendor who would have like a large solar infrastructure and then Kind of like with our discussion with the airplane guy. Yeah. And then they're not paying any. I think under this regulatory scheme, they would just be regulated, like charge point would on be. On the consumer basis, but not on the. Not on any of the rate setting basis. I don't know that it's realistic. I just. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, because if you're not, there, there might be some weird regulatory situation where you build a generation, whatever it is, solar or not, and then you're only selling it to charge vehicles, and this kind of exempts you from PUC for selling electricity for charging vehicles, you're basically getting around the regulation of building a generation source. I, I think there's other issues, storage and things like that. But I think when the actual point of charging, there still would be regulation setting aside the generating of electricity. Well, what happens with so many people, if I wanted to put solar panels and generate a lot of electricity, um, and I'm going to charge my vehicle, then I'm going to avoid the charge, right? I'm well, only if you tie your solar panels directly to your vehicle. You're right, right. But that's, so then you could only charge when it's sunny. And most people want to have the flexibility of net metering and Charging whenever they want the to, or whenever the amount of solar panels to power cars probably a lot too, right? I don't know. Or yeah, I mean, would a home, would a home, you know, you know, with solar panels on a typical person's roof, for instance, do you think be sufficient to power? Yeah, yeah, if they just went to the car. Yeah, well, would put a panel there. That'd be cool. <laughs> or in our road. That's right. I mean, you need a big enough array over the course of the year. So, like in the winter, you, it would be very difficult. But in the summer, it's really no, I was just thinking there there might be circumstances where people wouldn't be paying this um, charge yes. at all, there, depending on what they have for generation, or um, as yep. the development of batteries gets better to store the solar. Um, I don't okay. know. Okay, right, let's I think the fee is small enough to where it wouldn't be worth it, but it's, we could think about more about that. It would be the same issue if someone was choosing to plug into their regular residential energy source right. as opposed sure. to. That's what we want. 